Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome friends. Uh, in this lecture today we are going to start a new topic on state and sovereignty. And in this lecture we will be focusing on the introduction part of it to understand the significance of state and its centrality in uh, political theory or in political discourse. And we will discuss uh, different conceptions of state and sovereignty by discussing the argument of um, Hobbes. Locke and Rousseau. So, in any political discourse in modern times, a state is at the center of any political discourse. So, for a very long time, when we discuss or think about the state, we think of a state as a kind of institution, which is in at least in the common sensical understanding, it is seen as something as a kind of distant body and uh, whole uh, focus of political uh, theory or uh, political discourse is to understand this uh, institution which we call a state. Now, uh, gradually we have seen how uh, and that we will discuss throughout uh, these lectures on a state that how a state encompasses every sphere of individual and collective life and no longer merely a kind of distant body sitting uh, somewhere at distance and then trying to controlling, regulating the rest of the uh, society. So, for a very long time in political science or in political theory, the uh, theorization revolves around the state and its institution. Now, gradually we have seen the pervasiveness of a state is equally there in the sphere of say society or economy or uh, say uh, other forms of uh, unions or associations and so on. So, uh, gradually the idea of state has broadened or uh, have become more comprehensive than merely the uh, limited or very um, restrained kind of understanding about state as a body or as an institution sitting at some distance and we should be thinking about uh, that. Why a state is central to any political discourse that uh, all the concepts that we have discussed say for example, equality, liberty, justice and so on. It is uh, understood or it can be explained only through its relationship with the state. A state is an institution which ensures the condition of justice, ensures the uh, condition where individual can exercise maximum freedom and so on. So, a state is therefore central to any political discourse in modern times, what are its characteristic? First, it is impersonal in nature. Now, the state and a kind of political authority did exist prior to the modern state. So, this uh, definition of impersonal nature of uh, state is only the modern phenomena. Prior to uh, modern phenomena. Prior to uh, a modern state, a state did exist, but its authority was seen as a extension of the personality of say monarch or any tribesman or chief. So, uh, when you uh, refer to a state in pre-modern time, you refer to a particular person, particular dynasty, particular kingdom and then a state is seen as a kind of private or a kind of connection or extension to that person, that dynasty, that kingdom and so on. Only in modern times, a state is seen as impersonal, that means it is seen as distinct from both ruler and the rule. For example, Indian state or India of today, the ruler is the BJP as a government which 
has got the mandate of the people to rule. So, they are the ruler, right? And the ruler of the rest of the people of India. Now, the Indian state and the idea of Indian state is very distinct from both the BJP as the ruler or the government or the rest of the uh, population. So, uh, the defining characteristic of modern state is impersonal nature, it is nobody's personal property or personal freedom in that sense, it has a very impersonal nature. It controls monopoly of legitimate violence. Now, that uh, characteristic of state which gives its, its monopoly of legitimate violence that we need to understand why state is central to political discourse. So, no other authority or institution or association can uh, unleash violence or um, can control and subject others in the position of victimhood or so on. Uh, that uh, exercise or that um, use of violence will be regarded as unlawful or illegal and that person who is committed in such violence or such acts may be subjected to laws and coercive institution of state like police, army and so on. But a state in modern times has monopoly of violence. This monopoly of violence you can understand by this idea that a state can legitimately if it has not abolished death penalty, can take the life of its citizen by following the procedure established by law. So, that means, it is legally has monopoly of violence. So, within a demarcated territory, it has unquestionable, in unquestionable in a sense, it, its action is subject to criticism or a scrutiny, but it has the uh, monopoly of legitimate violence. So, the institution like army, police, paramilitary forces, uh, prison, court and so on are the uh, uh, representative of this idea that a state in modern times has monopoly of legitimate violence. All the other groups or associations or institution which unleashes violence in the society is or are subjected to the control or uh, the regulation of the state, but a state within a territory has monopoly of legitimate violence and is often regarded as the modern political institution or a body politic or the institution of government or an organized political community. So, a state can be understood in all these ways as a modern political institution or body politic or the institution of government or an organized political community. So, the idea of stateness is about extension of state from its limited institution or its limited understanding to understand how this idea percolates down to every sphere of individual and collective life. The state has absolute sovereignty over a defined territory. So, this concept what is sovereignty and how it gives the state power and authority within a given territory we will discuss in the second part of this lecture. But modern state has absolute sovereignty over it within a defined territory. There are some common attributes of a modern state and these are a state is a public institution and not a private entity. So, modern state or modern Indian state cannot be said it is the say BJP's state or Congress state or someone else state. But prior to modern state in India, we could say there are British rule in India or say Mughal rules or uh, Gupta's rule and so on. So, the state was seen as an extension of a particular individual dynasty or kingdom and so on. Only in the modern time, state is seen as a public institution, impersonal in uh, nature and not a private entity. Sovereignty as the basic feature of the modern state and what that sovereignty is, we will discuss in the second part of this lecture. Application of law, the modern state is based on this application of law as the supreme authority. So, within this, um, the legitimacy of that law is within that particular territory over whom that state rules or governs. The impersonal bureaucracy, so bureaucracy of the state do not take the partisan position, it is a kind of uh, impersonal uh, bureaucracy 
and uh, recruitment to that bureaucracy is through this impersonal rule where uh, Bavarian model of bureaucracy if you like is about the impersonality. So, uh, a state and its institution uh, should not and must not take the side, it must uh, be neutral, impersonal in its implementation of policies, in its formulation of policies, in its uh, application of law and so on. So, the impersonal bureaucracy is the other characteristic of modern state and a state's capacity to impose and collect taxes from its citizens that is the another objective of or characteristic of modern state. This state is necessary to protect human lives from two things any threat to the individual life internally and externally. A state must ensure that the life and liberty of every single uh, citizen and of its uh, citizen must be protected from internal and external threat. And the biggest uh, reason data or the uh, responsibility of modern state is to maintain law and order. So, this is the prime responsibility of modern state to ensure law and order in any society and uh, also protect individual lives from uh, internal and external threat. Now, it makes legitimate use of force within a demarcated territory this point which we have discussed that modern state uses or has monopoly of violence and that violence it can unleash within a dem demarcated territory or if there is a aggression. Uh, or it tries to you know uh, resist the external aggression or if it is at war with the other states. So, only in that case it can unleash violence outside that demarcated territory, but by and large within a demarcated territory a state makes uh, the legitimate use of force. So, a number of political thinkers have put forward various definitions of a state or modern state. For example, the German sociologist Max Weber argued that state is an institution that claims monopoly of legitimate violence. So, that is the definition of modern state uh, or Weberian model of state where it is seen as uh, the institution which claims the monopoly of legitimate violence within a particular territory. So, these are two things first is the uh, monopoly of legitimate violence and territory. So, territoriality monopoly of legitimate violence is very central to the Weberian conception of modern state. However, he also said that the use of force is not the only attribute of the state, but it is a central one. So, the state therefore, is by nature a coercive institution. So, it restricts, it uh, put a limits to the individual actions and movement if it is against the wider law and order and so on. So, it is not the only attribute of the state, but it is central one. A state can be welfare state, uh, liberal state, democratic state, authoritarian state and there are different nature of states which we will discuss later on. But the modern state is seen according to Weber as claiming or having the monopoly of legitimate violence within a particular territory and this monopoly of violence is legitimate uh, violence. So, the two things is very clear in Weberian model of uh, or definition of a state that it has monopoly of legitimate violence and the idea of territoriality. So, that legitimate violence or monopoly of legitimate violence is applicable within a demarcated territory. So, the territoriality or monopoly of legitimate violence define the modern state, its impersonal nature and so on the bureaucracy then he goes on to explain is something which also defines the modern state. Now, for Robert Dahl, he uses the term government and state interchangeably. Now, this point we need to keep in mind when we argue about state. A state is a permanent body, but government is something which we elect in modern times if the state is a democratic state and it uh, holds election regularly in a free and fair manner, then government may come and go, but a state is a permanent entity which is always there, right. But for Robert Dahl and however, we often use the state and government interchangeably and Robert Dahl was one such scholars which argue 
that government and state is one and the same thing. For Hegel, the state is uh, seen as a kind of uh, march of God on the earth. So, for him, a state is the realization of morality on earth or more precisely, a state is the divine idea as it exists on the earth. So, remember the idea of uh, monarchy or the king as the divine representative on the earth and the divine uh, rule of pre-modern state was based on that conception that uh, king is the representative of God on the earth. Similarly, in modern uh, times, Hegel argues that a state represents the universal will or it is the upholder or the protector or ensures the realization of morality on earth and therefore, he sees a uh, state as the divine idea that can exist on earth. So, the state is seen as the representative of such high order moral ethical principles and values. Similarly, T. H. Green spoke about a state as supreme coercive power, but he also said that such power should be exercised to achieve moral ends. So, this coercive power or monopoly of uh, legitimate violence as in Weber must be used for the realization of something which is moral or ethical. So, it can be argued that will and not the force is the basis of a state. So, the will power, the willingness of the people is the basis of a state and not its force or the physical force. So, the legitimacy of the state or the modern state rests not entirely on the coercive or its military nature or the violence or monopoly of violence, but on the willingness on the part of a people to give the consent to uh, the state to rule over them. So, the legitimacy of the existence of a state rests more or at least equally on the will of the people than the claim of a state over uh, violence and so on. So, some thinkers have argued that a state is a mixture of both force, law, rights and morality. So, a state is a combination of all these things, not merely the force, not merely the law, not just the will or the rights and morality, but a kind of combination of both. So, for instance, Machiavelli's prince and his ways of ruling over people and beast through the use of both law, morality and force is a case in point in this regard. So, laws applies to the subject people and force is applied where the need arises to dominate or fight against the beast or enemy. So, the state in that sense is a combination of both the moral, uh, the judicious or the rightful and also the uh, brute coercive physical force. Similarly, Antonio Gramsci, an Italian Marxist argued that a state applies force, but law, rights and morality are equally important for the legitimacy of the state. Now, if you look at the formation of uh, modern state prior to the emergence of modern state, the idea of divine law governed or ruled human lives and their relationships. So, every sphere of human life was governed by this idea of divine law. So, it is believed that such divine laws came from a supreme non-human power or God to rule over human lives and to make them acknowledge and understand the power of God or divine laws on the earth. So, the monarchy monarchy as a system of political rule was based on this divine law. right? So, after the fall of Roman Empire in Europe, the, uh, the idea of modern state is also uh, historically emerged in the Europe, especially after the Treaty of Westphalia, which we will discuss later and then it extended towards other part of the uh, world. So, after the fall of Roman Empire in Europe, the landed nobility and Catholic Church appeared as messenger of such divine laws and imposes it over the people to follow and obey them. So, the rise of the church and its authority after the fall of Roman uh, Empire is the precursor of modern state and then after the religious war, there was the gradual decline of church and assertion of political 
autonomy or the political independence and that leads to the creation of modern uh, sovereign uh, state which subordinates say religion, economy and so on. So, these laws are found in religious books and it is enforced through economic and social relationships by the conquerors of then Europe. So, the rise of uh, the monarchy or kingdom was the result of this uh, fall of Roman Empire and the resurgence of Catholic Church uh, in Europe. However, some changes occurred simultaneously like the growth of merchant trading or more precisely the rise of merchant capitalism and with that growing uh, middle class in Europe and their demand for protection of safety, security, rights, uh, protection of life and so on uh, leads to the creation of modern democratic or representative form of government which would be impersonal, which should not be the extension of uh, a person or a dynasty. So, uh, there were significant changes in the 16th and 17th century in the old set of, of social relationship or social transformation in Europe. So, 16th, 17th and 18th century was the period when there was a new discourse about human being, the fate of human being, idea of dignified life or the idea of legitimate rule, ruled based on the people, the natural right and so on and that leads to a new uh, discourse about the political uh, authority and the political uh, organization of the state and its legitimacy whether it is it should be based on this idea of divine right and the legitimacy of a state and its existence should be justified in the name of divine right or it should be based on the consent of the ruled or consent of the people. So, the whole argument about the social contract or uh, Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau and so on are reflection or representative of that kind of churning that was going on in the political discourse. So, although the divine laws were still ruling over the people or their psyche, the monopoly of church was declining. So, gradually there is a kind of assertion against the authority of the church or the Catholic church. So, the church of England was the first such uh, resistance against the interference of the uh, religious authority in the matters of politics. And from then on there is a kind of emergence of absolutist state. Uh, asserting its independence that further leads to the representative or modern democratic state in Europe. So, what was happening that divine law was still ruling over the people, the monopoly of church was declining and as an outcome of religious wars, new system of political rule emerged. Thus, the modern system of state that we have emerged out of the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648 which believes that all states are equal, it is divide the world into different states and all states are regarded as having the equal status in the eyes of the international. So, in any international debates and discussions or forum, all the states are treated equally without any consideration to their uh, territorial size or the size of their population. All uh, states uh, have equal status in the international forum. So, for example, in United Nations General Assembly, a state like India and USA has a uh, same vote as say Papua New Guinea or a smaller state like Bangladesh or so on. So, the emergence of modern system of a state or modern state is uh, the result of this Treaty of Westphalia failure in 1648 after the 30 years of religious wars which witnessed the emergence of autonomous political sphere in Europe independent of church and religion. So, that assertion of the independence and autonomy of uh, the state and which we also discuss as the idea of secularism, where uh, the religion must not interfere in the matters of politics. So, politics and religion is seen as separate and church as the religious authority must not interfere in the matters of politics, which is the domain of uh, monarchs. So, the absolutist state and their resistance against the um, interference of the church or the Catholic church was the result of modern state. Further on, renaissance and religious reforms movement in the form of protestant ethics, which focused on the individual rights and his or her entrepreneurship that uh, enables him or her to lead a dignified life. So, this Weberian idea about the rise of capitalism in Europe 
is the result of the Protestant ethics. Similarly, in the political field, the idea of a dignified life or the individual having certain rights, uh, individual must take actions concerning his uh, personal life and so on is the result of this discourse of renaissance and religious reforms movement in the forms of Protestant ethics. It further led to the beginning of new thinking about organizing self and the community lives in Europe and their focus was on rationality or reasoning capacity of individual. So, individual as rational being or having the capacity to reasoning must make their lives worth living for or in other words to live with dignity. To live with dignity is to have the condition where individual can take the decision concerning about his or her life and each individual is regarded uh, capable of taking such decisions because he or she is uh, rational. So, the Descartes understanding that I think therefore I am. So, that thinking is the uh, reflection of this uh, new discourse in Europe about how to lead a good life and this um, idea, this new discourse lead to a new uh, kind of uh, creation of political structure which recognize the individual his dignity and protect his or her rights to create the condition in which he or she can live a dignified life. So, the whole structure of modern state revolves around this new understanding of self and the community and how state ensured those conditions where such life with dignity is possible. So, the formation of modern state and its legitimacy was seen as a precondition for living a dignified life. So, state is necessary. Why it is necessary? Because it creates the condition, it provides the condition for the individual and communities to live a dignified life. So, therefore, state must protect certain inalienable rights and freedoms of the individuals. This new discourse replaced the divine right justification for the existence of state as it is based on certain new responsibilities and the consent of the people. Now, modern state is also a nation state and it gives it enormous power and control over its citizen. Now, the state combined with technology of surveillance governs every sphere of individuals and collective lives and there are different conception of modern states such as liberal, Marxist and uh, this idea of governmentality which we will discuss in one of our lecture. So, these forms of a state and its authority we shall discuss in the subsequent lecture. Now, we will come to the second part where we will discuss the idea of sovereignty which is the defining characteristic of modern state. So, sovereignty is the absolute authority of a state within its territory. So, basically in the simple uh, language sovereignty is the power or the uh, authority which ensures uh, the supremacy of a state within the territory. So, in a particular demarcated territory, a state is the supreme institution. So, no other institution of the society is above the state. So, sovereignty is the absolute of authority of a state within uh, its territory. It is referred to the coercive form of power and authority. It legitimizes the use of coercive power of a state over its people and their institutions. So, a state can force or compel the people to comply with its laws and its policies or any institution of society must functions under the regulation or control of the state. So, in that sense a state has both the coercive power and its use of that coercive power is legitimate uh, within the given uh, territory if the state is the legitimate or it has the legitimacy in the eyes of people. So, sovereignty is then dominant, absolute, supreme and inalienable. So, sovereignty gives the state uh, the status of absolute authority, supreme authority and this sovereignty of a state is inalienable. That means, it cannot be transferred to some other ent entities internally or externally. So, it resides with the state. So, thus the possessor or holder of sovereignty is superior among all other authorities under its jurisdiction. So, within a demarcated territory, the state which holds or possesses 
sovereignty is the supreme authority. So, French theorist Jean Baudin defines sovereignty or law as the command of the sovereign. So, sovereign is the supreme authority and it resides in the single individual. So, in Jean Baudin's conception of sovereignty, it resides in the single individual. Hobbes said um, and we will discuss Hobbes that sovereign is above the law. So, the one who is sovereign according to Hobbes is not subject to the laws which uh, governs and controls the ordinary uh, citizens in a society or in a state. Sovereign is above the ordinary laws. So, an important uh, element of sovereignty however, is the idea of territoriality. So, uh, the exercise or the uh, legitimacy of the state as the sovereign entity is within a particular territory. So, it defines that sovereign can rule over all members residing within a given territory and that is the defining feature of modern state. So, some political thinkers argue that sovereignty has always existed and it is not a modern concept or it came into existence along with the arrival of modern state. So, there are many arguments about the existence of sovereignty. So, many scholars have argued that all the states even uh, the monarchs or the feudal states or so on did enjoy uh, sovereignty. However, its forms were perhaps different in nature. The idea that God exercised sovereign powers or divine laws had absolute power or control over people and it focuses that sovereignty was existed even in pre-modern period or before the existence of modern states. So, many scholars have argued that sovereignty as a form of authority, as a phenomena which gives the state or the political organization of a society uh, the supreme status uh, is something which existed uh, prior to modern state also. So, for a monarch in pre-modern time, uh, he was the supreme entity within uh, his monarchy or within his or her kingdom. So, sovereignty in terms of absolute supreme authority within a given territory uh, is something which existed uh, prior to modern state as well. However, the idea of modern state as a sovereign body has a particular use in modern times. So, perhaps it have existed in pre-modern times, but its nature might have been very different. Now, in modern times, modern state as a sovereign entity has two dimension. First, within its internal uh, demarcated territory, it is the supreme authority. So, the citizens of a particular state must abide himself or herself by the laws of that particular state. So, every sphere of individual and collective life within a given territory is governed and controlled by the state and within that territory there cannot be outside interference or any external authority must not interfere in the internal matters of the state. So, that is the guiding principle of modern inter-state relationship or the foreign relationship where all the states treat other states as sovereign and thereby independent or supreme authority within that given territory of that particular state. So, internally a state is regarded as a supreme authority and externally a state is treated equally. So, this point we have discussed that even the smaller and the bigger state has the same or equal status in the international forum and regarded as the legitimate representative of the voices of their people internationally. So, the, on the international forum that particular state is regarded as the authoritative voice or the representative of the voices of their people. So, Indian state or Indian prime minister in the international forum represent authoritatively or the legitimate representation of the voices of people of India. So, that is the understanding of modern state which is also a nation state and its sovereignty has two dimension. Internally, it is regarded as the sovereign and externally it is treated as equal at par with the other states and representative of the uh, voices of their people. Now, if you look at these three scholars and through them we try to understand 
this idea of state and sovereignty. So, starting from Thomas Hobbes, he wrote a text in the beginning or he is regarded as the first modern political thinker for his uh, understanding of uh, this state and why we should obey the state, not because state exists for some divine purposes, but the very creation of a state is based on the consent of the people. And once we give the consent to the state, we must obey the state. So, his theory of political obligation is a kind of radical departure from the earlier understanding of political obligation. Uh, so, for the existence of a state, he argues uh, that the uh, individual's life in the state of nature, which is a hypothetical state, uh, which is believed to have no law, no security and no authority to arbitrate disputes and protects the life of individual. So, in that state of nature, there lies an atmosphere of tension and fear of violence, of war of all against the all. So, in that state of nature where the very life of individual is at constant threat and everyone was uh, at war with each other, there cannot be progress, there cannot be uh, order, there cannot be any uh, development. So, when the very survival of the person is uh, under threat, there is no possibility of any progress, any development or any growth for the individual and for the society. Now, to uh, regulate, to ensure order or to uh, establish order in such a state of nature, there was necessary to come together and have a contract thereby trading certain rights of the individual to the sovereign who can be a person or a body of person and this person he called the sovereign which is the result of the people living in a state of nature where the condition of life is nasty, brutish and sort, everyone is at war with each other and there is all pervasive violence and constant threat to life and therefore, individual came together to form uh, a sovereign which will establish the order in the uh, society and that will lead to a kind of protection of life and that will lead to further progress and development and so on. Now, the creation of the sovereign is the result of the people coming together and giving away or compromising certain rights. Now, the subject must establish a mutual contract to obey a common authority. Now, this idea that all the people living in a state of nature come together to establish a mutual contract to have a common authority who is the sovereign and this sovereign he gives the name Leviathan and they must obey his commands. So, here for the first time the idea of political obligation is not embedded in some religious or the cultural discourse. It is a very scientifically objectively explained in a sense that uh, people came together themselves to create a sovereign which is Leviathan and that creation of Leviathan is the coming together of the people. So, the basis of the existence of the sovereign is not in divine right or not some religious discourse. It is the people coming together creating a sovereign. Now, once the people decided mutually to form a sovereign, then it is the responsibility of the people to obey that sovereign or the command of that sovereign. So, they cannot uh, reject uh, the uh, commands or the orders of the sovereigns and therefore, the people must obey the commands of the sovereign. However, in this scheme of the sovereign, in this scheme, the sovereign is not the subject to the terms of contract. It is also scientifically explained. Why? Because the sovereign is not the party of the contract, it is the people who is the party of the contract and therefore, sovereign cannot be subjected to the terms of contract because it is the independent, autonomous from the contract because it, the contract that creates the sovereign is among the people and therefore, the terms of contract is applicable to the people and therefore, they must obey the sovereign. However, the sovereign himself is not party to the contract and therefore, is not subjected to the terms of that contract. So, in other words, the sovereign is free and independent of the terms of contract and Hobbes further emphasized that individuals should surrender 
or transfer their rights and freedom to the sovereign. But he also said that the political obligation or obedience to the sovereign would end if he fails to, he here is the sovereign. sovereign if he fails to protect individuals from war and violence. That means, if he, uh, the sovereign fails to protect the life of the people, then people can defy or reject to follow the command uh, or the order of the sovereign. Because the very purpose of coming together and creating the uh, sovereign is to protect one's life. If that is not being protected by the sovereign, then people may not obey. Uh, the sovereign. Otherwise, people must in all conditions subject or surrender himself or herself to the uh, order or the command of the uh, sovereign. So, there are criticisms uh, to Hobbes concept of sovereignty and critics have argued that Hobbes leave the individual at the mercy of sovereign. So, sovereign is given the supreme or absolute power over the people and their uh, existence is at the mercy of sovereign. Macpherson criticized Hobbes sovereignty and model of state on the ground that Hobbes was arguing for creation of a free market society and protecting the possessive individuals of a capitalist economy. So, the kind of uh, behavior that uh, Hobbes is arguing in the state of nature was actually the way individual behaves in a competitive market economy. So, it is not really the state of nature, but the, uh, the market economy that Hobbes is talking about and he wanted the state to enforce the contract, enforce the uh, order in that society, whether that kind of uh, bourgeois or the possessive individual can uh, interact for commerce, trade or industry and so on. However, what we find in Hobbes is a kind of creation of absolute all powerful sovereign who is independent of any covenant, he is not part of that contract and citizens are duty bound to obey the sovereign. So, why we should obey the sovereign is rationally scientifically explained because we ourselves come together and form uh, the sovereign body and therefore, since that sovereign body is our own creation, we cannot defy, we cannot disobey that sovereign. Only condition of disobeying is when that sovereign in fails to protect the life of the individual. Otherwise, we must uh, in all condition, in all circumstances subject or surrender ourselves to the command of the sovereign. So, there is a kind of absolute or all powerful sovereign in the uh, Hobbesian understanding of uh, sovereignty. Now, in Locke what we find however, is a kind of minimal or it is kind of accountable or uh, what you call uh, limited sovereign. So, Locke did not support an arbitrary or absolute sovereign power or sovereignty like Hobbes. For him, the state is bestowed power by the individuals to protect their lives and property. So, these two things, not just the life, but also the property is the responsibility of a state to protect the individual's life and liberty. However, if a state fails to protect individuals and fulfill their interests, individuals have the right to overthrow the government. So, in Locke, there is the scope for people to resist, to revolt against the state, to uh, throw the sovereign and create a new uh, sovereign which can then promise to protect individual lives and property. So, Locke emphasized on a constitutional and not absolute and arbitrary form of uh, government where the executive and the legislature uphold the political power and they will continue to enjoy powers so long as they are based on the consent of the people. So, the consent is very crucial. So, he said that man may have at one time been willing to give power to a single good and excellent man to a kind of national authority, but then finding that his successor could not keep their property secure in the same manner insisted that power be placed in collective bodies of men. So, there is the possibilities of throwing uh, the guard and the sovereign and creating a new sovereign for the protection of individual lives and property. So, thus Locke was against absolute form of monarchy or any kind of absolute government. So, he talks about a limited government based on the consent of people uh, which can 
protect the individual lives and property. Rousseau on the other hand, we find a kind of a radical uh, interpretation of uh, sovereignty which he explained in his text on the social contract written in 1762 and for him a state resides in the people who actually surrenders their freedom or liberty to the state and a state is representative of general will. Sovereignty resides in the people who actually surrenders their freedom or liberty to the state and a state is representative of this general will. So, this general will is the central idea in Rousseau's conception of sovereignty and state. So, a state formed by a social contract should treat every individual as equals. The idea of general will that is a basis of such a state has a radical conceptualization in Rousseau and he argued that general will is about ensuring the maximum freedom of all. So, in Rousseau the starting point was in the state of nature the life was really perfect, there was no inequality, there was no injustices and people had maximum freedom in the uh, state of nature. It is only in the society and state where there is all pervasive inequalities, injustices and uh, people are everywhere in the chains. So, uh, to create that kind of society and state where individual can exercise maximum freedom, Rousseau talks about this idea of general will and he wanted the state and the sovereignty based on this idea of general will. So, and only that government is legitimate which is based on the general will. Now, this general will is something which is in the interest of all and not in the personal interest of few, many or one person. So, once this uh, general will is constituted, that is the basis of state and sovereignty, individual must obey it. So, here unlike Locke and like uh, Hobbes, he is also arguing for a kind of absolutist state or absolutist um, uh, conception of sovereignty where he want that uh, the state and the sovereign must be based on general will, that is will of the everyone, that is in the interest of every member of that society which will ensure their maximum freedom. But once that conception of general will is constituted, then everyone must obey it, they cannot defy it. In fact, he um, goes on to argue that one can be forced to be free. This idea of forced freedom individual can be forced to be free by ensuring that he must follow the general will. Thus, in Rousseau like Hobbes, we get an idea of an absolute and all pervasive, all powerful sovereign. Now, there are many criticism to uh, Rousseau's idea of sovereignty or general will. Many scholars have argued that it may legitimize the authoritarianism or dictatorship. So, for Rousseau, general will can be the will of all people or few people if they are working in the interest of all or it can be the will of a single individual. So, the general will not necessarily require the consent of everyone. It may be the will of only few if they are working in the interest of everyone or even one person who is working in the interest of everyone in the society. So, that may lead to uh, legitimize some dictators or some undemocratic uh, authority who claims to work on behalf of people or in the name of general will, they may legitimize their undemocratic actions. So, now this uh, idea of general will as the will of all or few or even one person gives a lot of a scope to governments or rulers to justify their undemocratic action in the name of general will. So, that is the kind of understanding that we have in Rousseau about the idea of sovereignty. So, uh, in uh, summary what we find in Hobbes and Rousseau, we have the absolutist conception of uh, sovereignty where within a demarcated territory, the sovereign body is the supreme body. In Locke, where we have a kind of limited or a kind of accountable uh, sovereign, where uh, the existence of sovereign is based on its ability to uh, a uh, 
protect the individual uh, uh, life and property and b it should be based on the consent of the people. So, people have right to overthrow the sovereign in log, but in Hobbes and Rousseau what we find once you create the sovereign, it is your obligation to obey the sovereign in all circumstances. So, Rousseau go to the extent of forcing the individual to obey the sovereign in the form of general. So, these are some of the debates about the idea of state and sovereignty. In the next class, we will discuss about different forms of state and sovereignty like liberal, Marxist and so on. So, uh, on this lecture, you can refer to some of these readings like Rajiv Bhargav and Ashokacharya, Political Theory and Introduction, there is a chapter on a state. And then uh, Martin uh, Conroy, the state and the political uh, theory you should refer to and also John Hoffman and Paul Graham, the introduction to political theory is a useful a resource to understand the uh, conceptualization of uh, modern states. So, that is all for uh, today's lecture. Thanks for listening. Thank you all.